Yeah, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, though, so if you've got your Bible, go there with me, Acts chapter 2. Um, if you don't have your Bible, you can download our app and follow along with us that way as well. Acts chapter 2. I want to start off this morning just by seeing how God formed the church, shaped the church, and let's set the stage just for a second. So just a couple of months before what we're getting ready to read, uh, just a couple of months before Jesus was crucified, he was buried, he rose again, and he hung, and he hung around for about 40 days, chatting it up with guys, and just uh, right after that, taken up to heaven. But as he was t- being taken up to heaven, he said, just hold on. I'm coming back, and I'm looking forward to that, amen. I'll be back. But in the meantime, head to Jerusalem and just wait there. And Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will come to you. And so they're in Jerusalem, and we've seen this last week. They're in Jerusalem. They're gathered together as the church, but they're not wasting any time, right? They're waiting on God, but they're not wasting time. They're together and they are praying. And then we're going to pick it up right here in Acts chapter 2. Read verse 1 with me. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So what we've got here is we've got a bunch of guys gathered together as a community of Christ followers and all of a sudden they hear this sound. Anybody ever been in a tornado? Hurricane? Right? Okay. It was that kind of a sound. And fire comes down and it separates and it lands on each one of them. I tried to find a, a really good photo, a really good illustration of this, you know, because I like visuals, but there, none of the illustrations do this justice. All of the pictures are all these guys sitting around with big smiles on their faces and little flames on their shoulders. That just doesn't do this justice. This is a fear-inducing, awe-inspiring moment. This is not some happy little breeze with tiny little flames. Actually, for just a moment this week, our deacons are gone, so I thought, you know, this would be a really good time to set some stuff on fire. (laughs) Really show you what was going on here. But I, I decided I like my job a little better than that. But I want you to get the idea that all of this language here in the Scripture, these rushing winds, this fire, these are Old Testament references. What Luke is getting here is there is a powerful God that is showing up on this scene. Think of Isaiah when he was whisked away into the throne room of God and and, and all these angelic beings with their thundering voices praising Almighty God. And the throne room is filled with smoke and Isaiah can't help but fall on his face and say, Woe to me, I have a man of unclean lips. This is what's going on in this room. God is here and he's doing something in our midst. Fear-inducing and awe-inspiring both at the same time. And there are a couple things that I want us to see real quick here. I want us to see, first of all, that our history, the, the history of the church is God's work. Completely God's work. Too often we think that it's our work. We think that it's all about, if only I had better leadership skills. If only I had better ministry ideas, or only if we work hard enough, then God will do something. Listen, that's not how we were birthed, and that's not how God operates today. It is solely God's work. Too often we get hung up on what kind of a good job that I'm doing. We start relying on our own abilities and our own ideas. Listen, Tucker family, they're wonderful, aren't they? Ain't nothing without Christ. Ain't nothing without Christ. This is God's work. We are here because God has intervened in the church. Not because we have done anything. But let me be very clear on something. We can position ourselves in a way that allows God to move. We can position ourselves. That's what the apostles were doing. We seen it last week. They were together. They were in the room, gathered together as a community of Christ followers. And what were they doing? They were approaching God. They were praying. And it wasn't some, now I lay me down to sleep. Man, you want God to move in your life? You get a hold of Him. Get a hold of Him. Wait on His promises. And that's exactly who we are to be. The second thing I want us to get, verse 4 says, they were speaking in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. 
Listen, the Spirit was at work here enabling this to happen. These languages are coming out. What we see here is these are God's people and they are called for God's purposes. And here is, I think, a a huge problem that we have in 21st century evangelicalism here in North America. We honestly believe that God calls us for our purposes. We honestly believe that God is here to make our lives better, that to make us more prosperous, to make us more blessed. Can I tell you what? We're here, not, God's here not to make our lives better, but we're here to engage in what God wants. Amen? We're here for what He wants. We are here as God's people not to have our needs met, but to meet the needs of others. We're not here to make ourselves happy, but to be involved in God's work. Something that I think is so key for the 21st century evangelicalism. We have a tendency to say, I want Jesus to enter my life. I want God to come and do something for me. Can I tell you what? That's not how it works. I enter his life. I jump into the river of his water. I jump into what he's doing. I go along for the ride. When we grasp this, when we grasp what's happening in Acts chapter 2, it's not that God is coming and helping the apostles do some really crazy things. What we really grasp is that God is is coming down and he's allowing them to be a part of what he wants. When you get this, it'll change your entire view of the Christian life. We need to get away from this stuff of God's all about doing for me. We got to be giving glory to God. We should be involved involved in the work of God. And I understand that that might fly in the face of some of the things that you may have been taught. So let me just help you out for a second. You jump into God's river, that's where you're going to get blessed. You jump into God's river, that's when that happiness that you're looking for, that's where you'll find it. That's where you'll find it. All right, let's move on. Uh, Verse 5. It says, Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Uh, When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't these all who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parinthians, uh, Medes, uh, Elamites, residents of Mesotopia, Judea, all those places, right? Yeah. Yeah. We hear them, (laughs) verse 11, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? So the Holy Spirit shows up and the very next thing that happens is there's all these Jews that are from all over the place. They're showing up and they're wondering, what's going on? And here's what I want us to get. There is a long list of all these places where this crowd is from. They're from all over the place. And as they gather in Jerusalem, the apostles who are newly anointed with the Holy Spirit begin to speak in their own language. And so here's what's going on. And we're going to see this throughout Acts as we study the book. But there are thousands of people that will put their faith and trust in Jesus. And then the next thing that's going to happen is persecution is going to show up. How many of you know that to be true? Persecution shows up. And as persecution shows up, all these people from all over the place are going to go back out into their world. And the gospel message of Jesus Christ is going to be spread. Not basic, not, most of the time it's not even because they want to spread the gospel. It's just because persecution shows up. They've got to flee. Listen, Jesus is going to spread his gospel. And if you're in the middle of it, and if you're there, and you want to be used, God's going to use you. I don't care if you can speak well. Listen, up here all morning so far. I don't care if you can speak well. I don't care if you can sing well. You want to be used, God's going to use you. He's going to use you. That leads me to a question that I think we need to ask ourselves. A question that many people never ask themselves. What's God brought you from? What's God brought you out of? And where is he sending you? Where has he placed you in the world to spread the gospel? When you go to work tomorrow, how do you spread the gospel? Are you looking for the opportunities that God's giving you? Or are you just there to earn a living? 
When you go to the restaurant after church today, are you there to just fill the belly up? Or is, there, is God working in your waitress's life? You know what our world needs? Our world needs nurses that will impact their patients with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our world needs city council members that will run to spread the gospel in their cities. Our world needs teachers to go to school and even though they cannot say the name of Jesus, to be Jesus with two feet in that classroom. That's what our world needs. Now, what opportunities do you have? How is God sending you? What, what's happening here in Acts creates a problem. Look at verse 12 with me. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Verse 13, some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. So basically, there's this large crowd and they're accusing them of, of uh, drinking two buck chuck at nine in the morning. And Peter stands up to answer him. He begins a defense of what's going on. Verse 14, and Peter stood up with the 11, um, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I have to say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Not that that stops some people. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The crowd sees these apostles speaking in all these foreign languages. And Peter stands up and gives his defense. And the first thing he says to these devout Jews, he said, listen, if you'd have read the scriptures, if you'd have read the book of Joel, and they would have, and if you'd known what it says, then you'd been, you'd been expecting this. And it's here. The Holy Spirit is being poured out. And at the end of Joel's quote there, Peter says, and all those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. We're going to come back to that just for a second. That's really key because in the Old Testament, that's all those who call on the name of Yahweh shall be saved, right? And we're going to come back to that because it's really important. But basically what Peter says is this. When the Spirit is at work, the Spirit always points people to Jesus. He always points people to Jesus. He doesn't point it. Not to me. Not to me. Spirit's not going to point to, oh, you guys are great singers. Good job. Spirit's going to point to Jesus. Always. He continues, verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth uh, was a man accredited to God by, uh, to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you and through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross. So after explaining the coming of the Spirit, the very next thing that Peter says is, Jesus came, he made himself known, and by the way, you killed him. Listen, Peter's indictment there is an indictment to all of us. I killed Jesus. You killed Jesus. Our sin killed Jesus. Verse 24. But, I love that word. Right? But God raised him from the dead. Praise God, right? The story doesn't stop there. 
God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep his hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You've made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with your joy in your presence. In other words, what Peter does here is he begins to say that God raised Jesus from the dead. And remember what David said back in Psalms. David said, I will not see death, which is kind of odd because David died, right? David did, in fact, see death. So Peter continues to explain this. 29, fellow Israelites, I can, see you conf- I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David did die and he was buried and his tomb is here to this day. Peter says, I know those perplexed looks you're giving me. Yeah, David's dead. What's, got, what's this got to do with all of this? Verse 30, but he was a prophet and he knew that God had promised him an, on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Thank God, he's on, thank God Jesus is on the throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God had raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. So Peter says, as he quotes the Psalm of David, David pointed to somebody that would not die. And Peter says, that is Jesus. That guy that we killed, he didn't, he's not there. Praise God, he's not there. Peter explains this outpouring of the Spirit by giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, the grave could not hold him down. Verse 33 Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Notice what Peter does here. Back at the end of verse 21, as he finishes up the Joel quote, he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And as he finishes up this explanation of the gospel, he says in verse 36, that God has made Jesus, whom we crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Peter says, this Jesus, this Jesus who you thought was just a man, this is the same Yahweh that we worshipped back in Joel. He makes that connection. And so the Spirit is poured out. And as the Spirit is poured out, Peter sees an opportunity to explain the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen. When we are the Spirit-filled people that we are intended to be, we are going to look so radically different from everybody else that people ought to look at us and say, what are you guys smoking over there? stuff. And that is a perfect opportunity for us to share Jesus. To share the gospel message. Verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? Peter replied, Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. What's Peter's answer? What shall we do with this? We've heard the gospel now, Peter. What do we do? We recognize that we have killed the Messiah. Peter answers him, repent. Repent. There are a lot of churches out today that don't preach that word right there. Repent. Turn from what you're doing and follow Jesus. And then he says, be baptized. Baptism is just a public acknowledgement that we follow Christ. Paul echoed these words uh, in Romans when he said, Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and confess with your mouth 
Stop living the life that you once lived. Now live a new one. And publicly acknowledge that new life and join with the people of God through baptism. Not long ago, somebody asked me to brief me. What, what do you think is the most basic message of the gospel? For me, it boils down to this. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Master. And if that's true, then it means that I'm not. And I'm just being honest here. Sometimes I have a little problem with that. Because I like being my own boss. I like deciding what I do every day. I like to decide how I spend my time. I like to decide how I spend my money. I want to be more of my own life. But the gospel confronts me with a very basic reality that I am not my own master. I am not my own Lord. Jesus is. And when I'm confronted with that reality, repentance has to come into play. It has to. I have to acknowledge that the life that I have lived is not pleasing to Almighty God. Peter's message to us today is that Jesus is Lord. You are not. Repent and be baptized. And then an amazing thing happens. And I'm, I'm going to go through this real quick and then I'm done. Peter finishes his message, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with all of the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Listen, I just want to lay in here, okay? This is not something that we aspire to be. How often I hear these verses just like this. If only we devoted ourselves to the Lord's teaching more. Or if only we broke bread together more. If only we had all of our possessions in common. If only we acted just like this. That's not the point of Luke's words here. What Luke is describing is the result of the Spirit's activity in the community of believers. That's right. It's the result. We do not try harder to be these things. When we become the Spirit-led people of God, when we open up our lives and we say, Yes, Lord. When we say yes, and the Holy Spirit fills us, this is who we become. It's a natural result of the Spirit's work in our lives. We will become a community like no other on the face of this earth. No other. We become a family that is loving, learning, worshiping, and attractive. When we are the spirit-led people of God, we become something that nobody else on this earth can be. There's a story told of a biker. Any bikers in here? There's a couple. There's a story of a biker who became a believer in Jesus and joined a church. He got involved in everything he could. Sunday school, small groups. He attended faithfully. And pretty soon he began to fade away. And before long he was absent from practically everything. And so one day the pastor picked up the phone and called him and said, Hey man, where have you been? We've been missing you. The guy said, You know, I thought the church would be more like my bike game. I thought we'd be close. I thought we'd do stuff together. But you guys aren't like that. So I went back to my biker game. What an indictment on the church of Jesus Christ. Really? We've become more of a country club. We are to be a generous community that God placed in this world to make his name known. That's who we're to be. Yeah. We're, not, we're 
we're to be a worshiping community that comes together and that gathers together at the Lord's table. We are to be a baptizing community, a learning community, a community where God works and moves. A community that when you walk in those doors or when you're gathered with God's people, things happen that can only be described as God's doing something. That's who we're to be. And can I tell you something? That's who we will be when we allow the Spirit to move. That's, right. That's who we will be when we allow the Spirit to move. Nobody should ever be able to say, you guys just aren't as close as my other group. My prayer is that we, right here at First Church, would be a Spirit-led community that God intended us to be. We, when we are that people, can I tell you something that's going to be attractive? And it's going to offer people something that they can't get anywhere else. They can't get it from the biker game. They can't get it from the bar down the street. They can't even get it in their own living rooms with the family. It's amongst God's people. That's who we are intended to be. So here's my question for you this morning. Are you a spirit-led person? Have you said yes to Jesus? Can I tell you something? I don't buy into this stuff that you can say yes to Jesus and then go about your life however you want. When you say yes to Jesus, you turn a new direction and you start following Him. That's who you become. There's, there's no differentiating uh, factor between being a Christian and being a disciple. They are one and the same. If you have said yes to Jesus, then you are following Jesus. Are you a spirit-led person? Is there something about you that is so radically different that people look at you and say, what are you smoking? Is there something about you that when you go to work, it's just like the presence of Jesus himself is there? Because guess what? If you're following Christ, the presence of Jesus is there. And he said yes to Jesus. Maybe, perhaps, you said yes to Jesus, but you're still trying to do things your own way. Man, I'm going to tell you something. Jump into God's river. There are blessings there. There's more joy there than anything else you'll ever find anywhere else. Jump into God's river. Surrender your life today. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know if there are chains that are holding you down. may be crashing in on you. Maybe crashing in on you this morning and you think, man, I don't even want to get up and go to church. But you did anyway. You did because God wanted to say something to you. Will you surrender yourself this morning? Let God take those chains and just break them. Throw them off. And become free.